And now, back to the Dr. A Show with your host, Dr. Will Aguilar. How do you go from abused, homeless, drug addict, and gang member to CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation? Well, our next guest did just that. Michael Cooley is a business development executive with over 25 years experience. His career took him from working in the mailroom to being a CEO of a multi-million dollar company. He continued as Director of Global Operations at a major software company where Michael oversaw operations in the U.S., Canada, London, Australia, and Singapore. Mind you, this was a man that was abused, homeless, and a drug addict. Today, Mike is the CEO of the Quinlan Companies, a record management company based in Providence, Rhode Island. Michael spreads the message that you can pick yourself up and succeed even when you have hit rock bottom. His book is of the same title, and he is here today to tell us how he did it. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. A. Thanks for having me on. It's our pleasure, Michael. Michael, you, you started life at a disadvantage. Please tell me what happened when you were growing up, your early years, when you were a little child. Well, my earliest memories that, that I recall is basically being shipped back and forth between two parents. My uh, my mother lived up in St. Louis. My father lived down in Texas. I was four or five years old. And uh, when when my dad moved down to Corpus Christi, Texas, and my mom shipped me down there, and I remember my earliest memories were meeting my new family. He had remarried, and uh, mm. she had two children of her own that were four or five years older than my little brother and me. Now, and now, now we, your mother, your now your mother, your birth mother, uh, no, she was an alcoholic, correct? She was, and and not just not just an alcoholic. I mean, what would be classified as a raging alcoholic, and so. a functioning alcoholic. So, she would she would start in the morning, and she would drink a, a, a fifth of whiskey a day without even thinking about it, and uh, and then spend a lot of her hours in and out of the bars from when they open to when they close, which is where I spent a lot of my time when I was with my mom. Uh, wake up and we'd go to the bars in the morning and me and my little brother would stay there all day long and and then when we'd come out it'd be nighttime and we'd come home to our little apartment. Wow. Now, now yeah, then what happened is that you went to live with your dad for a little while and it was there where your stepmom and your stepbrothers abused both you and your brother physically and verbally. Uh, yeah, I mean, every way you could imagine, it was it was physical, it was emotional, it was sexual. There were a lot of uh, a lot of very dark days as a little kid growing up, confused, where we could do the exact same things as our stepbrothers, and we would get beat for it, and they would get praised for it. And um, you know, one particular time I recall is 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 playing in the heat of the Texas sun, and my um, my stepmother came out. It was my earliest memory of her, and she broke off a rose bush branch and took the leaves off of it. And my little brother and I were in shorts, and she started beating us. And 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 the beating started then with the with the switch across our legs until the blood came out, and we were screaming. And wow. and and wow. that went on for uh, some probably ten or eleven years. Now your brothers, uh, your stepbrothers, pitched into this as well, right? Right. So what what happened, Doctor A, is that that they, you know, they would see what their mother was doing, and and so they would jump in, and they were m- older and much larger than my little brother and me, and 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 yeah, the, then they would start beating on us and hitting on us and and mm-hmm. picking on us and abusing us and. And that all went on behind the scenes while my father was at war. And you couldn't, you felt you couldn't tell your father. Well, the, what the the way it went was, you're a little kid, and and my stepmother would would tell us if if you if you tell anybody about this that it'll get worse. Mm-hmm. And then my stepbrothers would say the same thing that we couldn't even go to our stepmom because they were beating us behind the scenes. She didn't know about that. And then they would they all had the same thing that if you tell anybody it'll get worse, but mm-hmm. in the second grade, it was discovered the abuse that was going on. I was eight or nine years old, and I would stay with my my dad and step family during the school year, and then I would go to my mom's for the summer and 
one and my my stepmom used to beat us before we went to visit my mom because she was Mm. jealous of my mom and she wanted to remind us that if we say anything what would happen well Unfortunately, when we got up there to St. Louis, my mom was changing our shirts, and she noticed the whelps across our back. She called um, she called my uh, my dad and my stepmom, and and it got really ugly. And then my dad left for a brief period of time, but he ended up coming back because uh, he told my little brother and me that he didn't want us to be uh, raised in a uh, he didn't want my my new half brother mm-hmm. that that my stepmom and dad had together. She didn't want he didn't want him to be be raised in a broken home like my little right. brother and me were. So we went back. He said it would get better. He went back to work, and the abuse continued after he went to work. Now you said uh, at one time that the abuse gets to the point where you don't seem to care anymore. You become numb to it. I, I did, um, because it was happening all over the place. But you did get to the point where you stood up to uh, your stepmother and said no more at one point, and, and that, that stopped the, the, the events, right? Uh, how did you build up that courage? How do you, how do you get to that point? Well, you kind of you kind of explained it right there, where you said I got numb to it all. I also got numb to the abuse, and when I speak, I tell the story of what happens to a caged animal that you're that you're constantly beating for year after year after year. One of two things happens to that 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 animal: either the animal curls up in the corner and dies of the abuse, or they become enraged and they lash back out and and i I took the road of lashing back out and I stopped the abuse and then I left home at fifteen and that's when it, that's when I never went back to any single home again and I lived on the streets from there and and I took my rage to the streets. Tell us about the streets now you 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 turn to the streets, you turn to drugs and alcohol and and a gang, and you landed in jail several times. Tell us a little bit about the dark time in your life as I think back, probably the most difficult thing I recall is is again leaving home, living on the streets. I was living in alleyways and rooftops and hitchhiking all over the country and and I met a new family, and it was a bunch of dysfunctional social throwaways uh teenagers like myself and we we were we formed this family and then we began abusing other kids and i realized i had become what i was trying to get away from and i got in trouble with you know and then i started experimenting with drugs and alcohol basically having a death wish and ended up you know in trouble with the law for for one reason or another, and end up incarcerated and in and out of jail and in and out of the streets and basically um, roaming uh, roaming through life uh, just without a purpose, without a direction, uh, without anybody. I mean, nobody wanted anything to do with me because I was such bad news um, hmm. to everybody around me. Why do you think you, because you say you tried to pull yourself out of that, but you kept going back to making the bad choices. Why do you think you kept repeating those bad choices? Uh, I guess it was because, again, I never felt that I was, this is my own thinking after so many years, is that I never felt I was loved by any one single person. And I felt Mm -hmm. this gang was some resemblance of a family and I was making all the bad choices because they were making the bad choices, and I was trying to fit in, and I was trying to be loved, and I was trying uh, to to learn and, and become something, and all I was doing was getting further and further uh, uh, down, hitting the streets and, and hitting rock bottom, and that's all I was doing was following the leaders, and I just was following the wrong people. How do you recognize rock bottom? Hmm. Well, in, in my case, people ask me, when did you realize you hit rock bottom? And in my case, it didn't happen once. I actually hit rock bottom several times. It wasn't until I realized that everybody had locked their doors on me. Everybody had turned their back on me. I had nowhere to go. I had, I had no one to depend on, nobody to help pull me out. 
um, that I realized that it was that this was the the end of the road. And then when I reached that end of the road, I saw there are crossroads that I could either go down this one road, which is the only road I'd ever known, which was one that led to all the people around me, all the people in the gang. They either they either got locked up for life, or they died, or they went crazy, and and I either go down that road uh, of alcoholism and drugs, like my family and and, and the gang. Or there was another road. How does someone go from drug addict and living in the streets to CEO of a multi-million-dollar corporation? Find out as the Dr. Asia continues with our guest, Michael G. Cooley, author of Rock Bottom: From the Streets to Success. Stay with us. And now, back to the Dr. A Show with your host, Dr. Will Aguila. Welcome back to the show. Our guest is Michael G. Cooley, author of Rock Bottom, From the Streets to Success. Michael's story goes from living in poverty and abuse to homelessness in the streets of St. Louis and then to chairman and CEO of a multi-million dollar company. So, Michael, what was your turning point? Well, I call it when I reached the ultimate rock bottom. And as I mentioned, there's a there, there's a road that basically led led to my demise and, and what I call led me to hell. And then there was this other road that I had never been down before. Um, I didn't know anybody had gone down this road. I didn't know where it was going to lead me. But it's it's interesting because it seems like despite the situation you were in and even the possibility of dying and losing your life and everything. Still, a different road that would be a better road would seem to be scarier for you. That is absolutely the truth. And, and in fact, that's what I was afraid of, is that, that I would ultimately have to unlearn my past. I would have to basically have selective memory and use my past only as a reminder of where I came from. And I would have to basically what I call starting over as a different person and move forward, um, making better choices. And so what I saw myself doing was I, I didn't care what it was, whatever this, wherever this road led me, the next job that I took, the next opportunity I had, I was going to do everything I could to make everything I could make out of it and never look back. Now, you said you liked to work. What was it about work that you liked? You know, my father was always a blue-collar worker, and he was always the guy who was always there, but he always seemed to fall short of success, and he moved from job to job and so on. But the one thing I knew from my father was his work ethic, and he would get up and he'd arrive at work every day, and he would never take a day off sick, and he'd work very hard. I think I... That's one thing that I got from my father was a hard work ethic. So in in a job, when I went to work for a job, I always seemed to do pretty well in the job because, once again, I think I was looking for just some kind of appreciation, some mm-hmm. kind mm-hmm. of pat on the back, you know? So your job built up your self-confidence. Every time you would succeed at work, that would build up your self-confidence, and then it turned will build up your self-esteem. That's exactly right. And not only internally, but then what's would start happening with the job, particularly the one that I went to when when I started down that path, was it started to build me up in a way where I built myself mentally, emotionally, and physically. I mean, a lot of things changed about me based on just some some praise that I would receive from the people that I was surrounded by. So in essence, step one would be find something that that you're good at and build up your self-confidence so little by little you start rebuilding your self-esteem. Absolutely. And in addition to what I started to do was surround myself with Mm -hmm. people that I wanted to emulate or be more like and wanted to learn Mm -hmm. from. Basically, I found a company of mentors for me. Got it. And they that, that actually, really Dr. Good. A, they actually taught me how to be human again because I didn't know what that was. And, but not only that, you have to allow yourself to, to be a part of that group. 
because sometimes you you may you may try to sabotage yourself, but you have to allow yourself to do that, correct? It's true, and and I was so hardened by everything that happened from the past. I also had to allow myself, believe it or not, to be vulnerable to this input that I was receiving, and and, and that allowed me to learn and grow and become a different person. Did you? And, and I don't mean this as any in any way as a disrespect, but did you ever believe that you were a loser? Um, <laughs> actually, I would tell myself that again and again and again when I was growing up and what what I did wrong what what kind of person was I to have everybody um, feeling this way about me that that's all I was was a loser and I almost used it as a moniker for myself to give me an excuse that I was a loser I was it wasn't any good my stepmom my mom they fed it into my head my stepmom tell me, why did you come here? Why did you interrupt my my life with your with your dad? You you know you screwed up my life. My mom was like, I wish you were dead. I wish I'd have never had you. I wish you weren't born. You hear all those things and you start to believe them, especially when you're a little kid to a teenager. Well, that, that, it, it's it's just beyond me to understand how. You get to something like that, but um, you obviously did it. You you offer some excellent tip and advice. How about for people right, that are listening right now that that may have the same problems that that have turned to drugs, alcohol to relieve the discomfort in their lives? What do you say to them? Well, I say I say the one thing is if you are dealing with alcohol and drugs. It's hard enough just to go through life and get on your feet when you come from a situation like some of us have come from that you only increase the challenges by b bringing alcohol and drugs into the situation because you, you, you're now no longer in control at all of what, what's going to happen next. So that's one of the first things I had to do was I learned how to, how to have a good time and how to enjoy life without the drugs and alcohol. And, and that took kind of extreme measures. And it, once again, it goes to people I met who showed me how to have a good time and you didn't need alcohol and drugs to do it. How, how about it? What tips do you have for those people who are enduring abuse from someone else now? Whether it be physical, mental, e uh, even sexual, what what advice do you have for them? How do you, how do they stop that? They they've got to find somebody who can help them, and and because again, I I did it by leaving the situation, and eventually I left. I hitchhiked and and, and around the country, and it even got worse for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as my life goes, I, I would beg, I would borrow, I would steal. I would do so you ran, you ran away. You ran away rather than face it. I did. I did. I ran away from it rather than face it. But the thing that helped me get past it was meeting people who helped me to get past it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of these people that are dealing with the abuse, there's somebody out there, a family member or somebody, a friend, somebody that they can trust who can get them help. And and that's what I think you have to do is you have to find that. That, that that person that will help you break that chain of abuse that you're going through that you think you start to believe right that you're the loser mm -hmm. you're the one that's mm -hmm. wrong you're the one and you're not and yeah. and and, and so, somebody has to tell you that and that's what I try to do with the kids today who are going through it and that I speak to so you let you did not let this define who you are you refused to let this define who you were which is was almost what I was going to call the book is that mm -hmm. the 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 story of rock bottom was the story of what happened was I reached a point that I never gave up and I refused to fail in the end and mm -hmm. and, and and I had to keep putting that in my head that if I failed, I was going to have to go back to this life. So I had to refuse to fail. If you're going through something like abuse or alcohol or drugs or homelessness or helplessness, you've got to refuse to fail, and it starts with tomorrow. Another one last question I have for you um, is how, how do you go through all this with the history that you have and then get an employer to take a chance with you?
because somebody had to take a chance for you initially. Sure, and 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 what 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 and this when I speak at the prisons, I talk to them about making their way back into society and how you know nobody just sits there with a, a a sign waiting for you to come in. You've got to figure out how to make your way. In my situation, I say, if you're dealing with that, somebody taking a chance on you, just get a job, any job and just get a job. And then what I say is when I go to work in a grocery store bagging groceries, I see myself running a chain of grocery stores. When, oh, so you when, visualize, you visualize where you could be. Absolutely. And then you, and then you, then you figure out a way of getting there. That's you know, right. So I figured out, time. yeah, I figured out what, what I wanted my salary to be, what, what kind of life I wanted to live, what kind of career I wanted, how I wanted to contribute. I start visualizing all of that, and then I start now, attacking it every day. And now you run a multi-million dollar company. Uh, yes, for the, for the last six plus years, uh, going on seven years now. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. The book is called Rock Bottom. The author is Michael G. Cooley, and you can actually email Michael at mg. Cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y, at gmail.com, or you can visit the website at michaelgcooley.tateauthor, that's T-A-T-E-Author.com. Mike, thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. A, for having me. And that is our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to the show and making it a success that it is. You can follow us at our website, thedraashow.com, where you can listen to old podcasts and follow up with the new shows. Also, remember to follow us and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next week, this is Dr. A wishing you a healthy and happy week.